thank you for uh, for joining us. This is the FinTech Influencers, um, the latest in our digital offering to, to everyone all around the world. And I'm delighted that it is a, a truly international panel we've got today featuring London and the east and west coasts of America. Um, FinTech Influencers is brought to you by Harrington Star and the Realisation Group. Uh, and it's been a, a constant drive from us over the last four or five years to help drive growth and innovation in, in global fintech. Uh, we've been speaking on regular basis at least three times a year to some uh, of the real innovators, movers and shakers in the fintech world. Uh, and delighted today that we have made no exception to that with an all-star panel that I'm hugely excited to be working with today. Um, I'm going to ask them to, all, to introduce themselves and then we're going to dig into to really unlocking through this uh, most curious of times uh, that, we're, that we're living through at the moment, uh, a blueprint, a blueprint for, for the recovery, what the world looks like at the moment and how we can make sure that, uh, that all of you who are, who are tuning in or watching this later on and, uh, and everyone here that we can learn from each other and really drive forward and, and uh, see how we can make things happen in the future and create a blueprint for recovery as we've done with the FinTech Phoenix magazine that you may have seen through the, uh, the financial technologists uh, recently. So I'm going to ask all of you to introduce yourselves, if you'd be so kind. Arjun, you are to my left on, as my screen shows. So I want to start with you. Uh, please give us your, uh, your background. Hi, I'm Arjun. I'm the founder and CEO of Baton Systems. Uh, my background, I started off in engineering, uh, did a lot of product development, worked in enterprise software, got into payments about seven years ago and found this opportunity in, in uh, payments in capital markets. So started Baton Systems to solve a very specific problem that addresses the synchronization and orchestration of asset movements. So we started the company in, in uh, 2016. Uh, fast forward today, we are uh, close to 50 employees globally. We have offices in India, uh, London, uh, New York, and California. Uh, happy to that uh, we've raised uh, over $18 million in, in funding. Uh, Mark Beeston is on my board. Uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been an exciting journey. Certainly has been. It sounds like it's only getting more so as well with uh, everything I've been hearing and talking to you about of late. So thanks for, for that intro. Uh, below you, we have Claire. Claire Finn Levy, how are you? I am fine, thanks. Um, so I'm Claire Flynn Levy. I'm the founder and CEO of Essentia Analytics. Uh, we do behavioral analytics for equity fund managers. Um, so basically applying a similar idea to what pro athletes use in terms of analyzing their own performance um, to fund managers in helping them uh, mitigate their own behavioral biases and make more money as a result. Uh, I used to be a fund manager myself, which is why I do this today. I wish I had had this tool. Um, and I started the company uh, seven years ago now. Um, today, we analyze over $150 billion of assets every day. Uh, we are headquartered in London, but I'm actually based in the US and um, we're very, very much a flexible working organization. Uh, which you'll We're going to find out a lot more about, about that. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's a, it's a company I've been obsessed about since we first met many years ago. And it's, uh, uh, I love what you guys are doing. And we'll, I'm sure we'll dig into that a little bit more later on as well. Uh, next to that, Matthew, how are you? Hi, Toby. I'm good. Thanks, thanks for the... Tell uh, us all about I Push Pull. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks for the invite. So I'm, I'm Matthew Chung. I'm CEO and co-founder of I Push Pull. This is my second startup. Uh, we've been doing this one for the last five years or so. Uh, what we're doing is we're solving the complexities of data sharing, uh, data that's moved around via emails, spreadsheets, copy paste, and so on, and then replacing that with a streamlined workflow and live data. And everything that, we, that we're doing, you know, we believe we're challenging the status quo of how business users are working, collaborating, and sharing on data. And then we're challenging the status quo by making it simple and seamless to connect share and automate workflow between data applications and people in real time. Um, so it's essentially a universal problem that we're solving, but we're laser focused in on capital markets and a lot of the data problems you get in front office, back office, um, with a you know, broader view to then expand out later on. Absolutely. And solving real problems. I loved uh, our episode of FinTech Focus TV. I know all of you have guested on this at various stages throughout the, the uh the pandemic as it's evolved and uh, it's been great to see you guys all, you know, uh, thrive as well through all, through all of this. And last but my name is least, Mr. Beeston, how are you? Other than on mute. <laughs> oh, am I on mute? I'm not on mute, yeah. Not now, not now, we've got you now. <laughs> uh, there you go. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, so uh, Mark Beeston, I'm the uh, the managing partner and founder of uh, of Illuminate Financial Management. We are a purely uh, enterprise financial markets technology focused uh, venture capital firm. Uh, currently deploying from our uh, second fund. Uh, my background uh, kind of covers, uh, you know, I think all sides of the equation. I think I'm, I think I'm the oldest on this panel. Uh, so, you know, I spent half my career at Deutsche Bank on the uh, on the fixed income derivative trading and, and, and management side. Um, got very involved in market structure and market infrastructure. Even even back then, signed Deutsche up into clearing. Uh, when it was a lot less important 20 years ago than it is uh, than it is today, uh, went to the entrepreneurial side of the fence. So I've walked a few miles in the shoes of my uh, co co panelists. Uh, set up a trade processing business uh, for the Creditex Group that ultimately led to ICE acquiring that uh, that business, uh, and then I ran the post trade information business uh, at ICAP. Uh, including uh, launching their corporate venture unit before leaving in 2014 to form uh, Illuminate. Um, and uh, you know, our whole approach uh, is, is is very much to be industry connected, uh, and and to only deploy capital where we think we can actually help our companies uh, companies come to market. So, uh, as Arjun said, Baton are actually the first company uh, of a number that are in the, our second fund. Fantastic. And it's uh, and, and look, I think Illuminate are everywhere at the moment. So it's uh, it's great to see such a such a great success story coming through from what you guys are doing. And again, I think there's some real interest in and in uh, in what you can add to this uh, to this conversation coming up as well. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll I'll, I'll hog the panelists at the start, if I may, and uh, there'll be a few questions which I sort of run through. Uh, then for for everyone who's tuned in here, there'll be the opportunity using the Q and A section to uh, to post those through. They've, everyone's promised me they're not shy, and uh, we'll do their best to answer everything that comes through to to you all on that as well. So uh, please don't hesitate to uh, to open up questions and. Uh, and bring the, your your thoughts to the fore, um, Mark. If I may, I'm going to start with uh, start with you. I think there's a really interesting uh, play with regards to investment. It's something which everyone's been thinking about. I've seen a number of uh, of companies throughout the pandemic, which I think is extraordinary, announced that they've been that you know they've managed to raise and and have various levels of investment coming through. I think the natural sort of you know with, with the, the the now famous Sequoia uh, letter at the start of it, which sort of uh, uh, put the jitters into a, into a, into everyone at the start of the whole process that that came through. There's been a lot more positivity, I think, subsequently to that. For 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 you, sat on your side with looking at the future of fintech investment, where we're we going to see big changes. We're we going to see due diligence change. Are companies still interested in in investing? Are you still interested in investing? And how can that change with regards to this new world that we look at with so much video and and uh, lack of face to face meeting? What's what's the future of fintech investment? Right. Well, uh, I'm sorry for the rest Good of the panelists. Because I, I'm going to say I'm sorry for the rest of the panelists because that's a one hour. That's a one hour answer. <laughs> um, so, 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 look. I think we can. I, I think you know we can have a kind of quick recent history lesson as we kind of look. You know, to kind of look and learn to where we're going in the future. Right. So, you know, the world changed. You know, immeasurably. You know, back in March, we all we all know that. Uh, this is uh, you know this the way this panel is represented uh, kind of uh, underscores that um, and you know every business was affected uh, investing no different I think every investor in the world um, you know immediately went into a period of portfolio triage you know sit down with all your you know all your investments understand you know what their runway looks like um, and you know in our case you know you know we have uh, 14 companies remaining in our two portfolios. We went out to each of them and we said, "Look, you know, assume you sell nothing in Mar you know, from from March 2020 for the rest of the year, right? You know, what 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 does it look like? What action do we need to take?" Uh, and 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 thankfully, um, you know, an old adage that I've used very often back back from my trading days: better lucky than smart. Um, if you're investing in enterprise fintech, it's probably a lot better place to be than consumer travel and leisure right now. Um, mm. And uh, you know, and so that triage, uh, you know, exercise wasn't a particularly wasn't a particularly long one. There's definitely a reshuffling of the deck. Um, you know, if you were a company that had just raised money but not sold anything in the six months since you'd raised money, then well, you'd got good runway um, to find that growth. If you were a company that had hyper growth but were 
six months away from running out of cash, you know, mm. you know, you actually might have a problem. So, you know, you almost get this inversion of what quartile uh, companies sit in for a period. Um, a couple of things then then happened from there, which were pretty interesting. The first the first thing that was pretty interesting was that people have continued to sell, right? And and you know, some more so, some less so, but 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 you know, all the companies in our portfolio are selling things. A number of them have been having uh, record months, and you know, in a sense, that's not surprising, right? You know, we went through this wave of emergency digitization back in March. Um, it, it once again kind of you know puts into the headlights that you know is the existing infrastructure stack fit for purpose? You know we actually set Illuminate up five years post the post the, the global financial crisis because we didn't think that the existing stack was was fit for purpose and couldn't move fast enough to meet the needs of the industry that that had changed dramatically off the back of that crisis. And I think you know COVID actually actually only uh, serves to 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 accelerate uh, the adoption of solutions around around those challenges, and of course there'll be relative winners and relative losers. Then you come back to the funding point, and the thing that actually there was really surprising to us is that actually as we went into lockdown, which was then the weekend that Italy was rumoured to be going into uh, go, going into lockdown themselves. Um, you know, we had five companies of those 14 in some form of external, uh, externally led fundraising uh, event, four, four equity rounds, uh, one venture debt round. And as we sit here today in August, you know, we've closed three of the equity rounds. We've closed uh, one of the venture debt rounds and I've got a board meeting this afternoon uh, to sign off on the, the final one of those uh, final one of those equity rounds, which frankly, was astounding to me. Uh, <laughs> I remember sitting the team down in March and saying, "Look, well, you know, you know, you know, the, the, it's a pretty bi it's, it's not binary, but it's a pretty digital set of outcomes. It's zero, one, two, three, four, or five, and the smart money is not on five. Um, <laughs> you know, we're at we're 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 at four. Uh, you know, which is which is great. Let's not let's not jinx it. Um, you know, but we've also seen unsolicited investment interest in in other of the portfolio companies. So, so you know, deals are getting done. You know, we'll announce another deal in the next month or so, which which was not on the cards. Um, you know, inbound into our portfolio, we've got three deals at the top of our own portfolio that we're in very uh, very advanced uh, DD uh, DD on, and I would expect to get kind of consummated going into going into the third quarter. So. Deals are still getting done. Um, we are close to doing our first investment in a company that we have not met face to face. This is just the reality of our existence, um, you know. And you know, you've clearly got to do proper DD, um, you know. But uh, but but um, you know, we did we did pretty intensive DD uh, on companies before, and you know, this is just one more thing. Uh, to work around. So we are in invest mode. We're actually as excited uh, about the fintech uh, opportunity, um, uh, you know, and, and what the implications of COVID are for the sector as, as, as frankly, we, we've ever been and we're looking to deploy into that. So it's funny, so, so, the, so the bullish nature of it all is, is probably at odds with some of the, the sort of uh, fear that's out there in the marketplace at the moment. Is it the sector that's robust to that or? Um, well, I just, think just the, view, I think, the long term view. I think it's a I think it's a combination of things. I mean, so so firstly, there was that period where you know everybody was too busy just dealing with the crisis, right? You know, and you know, I, I, I'm an ex trader, so I'm very aware of when I sound like I'm talking my own book. So I don't want to look <laughs> like uh, you know Claire would run some analytics on me and tell me you know you're delusional. Um, <laughs> uh, capital D, big red letters. Um, um, the the you know so so I don't, I don't want to sound like that guy right you know it has impacted things it's impacted our own fundraising right you know you couldn't get anybody to talk about fundraising in Q2 but today you know the top of our fundraising pipeline for ourselves is is actually as as strong uh, you know as I think it's as I, as I think it's ever been um, so you know so yeah I, I you know I am bullish but I think that's because. You know, we, we are dealing in a world of must-haves. Um, we're dealing in a world that has, you know, has 
you know, had and continues to have a fundamental cost and control and capital and compliance challenge. Mm. And, and COVID has only, made that, has only made that worse and only served to kind of highlight that relying on 30-year-old vendors with on-premise solutions, you know, is not, is not the answer, right? You know, if you thought you had trade surveillance challenges before, how do you deal with it when your, you know, your head of dollar rate trading is trading from one end of the dining table with her partner at the other end of the dining table who runs macro relative value sales for another bank? Right. Mm. Uh, you know, these are the realities of the challenges that we have to face today. And, uh, you know, you need you need nimble solutions. And it's time for the you know, it's time for the industry to stop talking a strong game about innovation and start effecting a strong game around around adoption. And that starts mm. with some very, very simple you know, things, you know, cloud migration. Yeah, yeah, and I've I've had over fifty of the the fintech focus interviews over the last uh, last few months, and we've seen absolutely that sort of confidence and robustness all the way through the sector. None more so than the first uh, the first one I had of these, which was Arjun yourself, um, right at the very very start of the, of the uh, pandemic. And I remember talking to you about how um, you know confident you were about coming into into this thing. It was it was right at the very start of everything. There was panic going on across the markets, but there was a there was a extreme coolness about how you were approaching every, everything at that sort of stage. I'm really interested to sort of go on from what Mark was, was saying there about, um, you know, the, the sort of optimism and, and uh, the ability to, you know, to, to, you know, invest and look at these, these sort of uh, opportunities at the moment. Cash has been a very big, pro, you know, we, we talked there about burn rates for businesses at various different stages at different levels with the opportunities that are there and also, you know, colliding with a little bit of uncertainty still out, out there in the marketplace and no one really knows where this is coming through. Tell us your thoughts on how firms should be managing their cash at the moment. Yeah, I, it's an interesting phase we went through since March. I, so I think uh, I'd like to think of this as, as the third phase that we are, we are thinking through. And it's, it's only been six, seven months now, but I, I look at this as a third phase. And the first one was just shock and awe. Right. There was mm. it, it when 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 March happened. It was just shock and awe. I've uh, you know Mark and I used to have be on a call every three days and uh, uh, you know once every three days and and we were just managing cash, like you know we had to be extremely tight on this. We did redirect on a few offers that even even we went back and re redirected on a few offers that we made, saying that look uh, what happened. We do not know what the world is going to be. Uh, there was absolutely very little visibility on that one. So at that point in time, it was just conserve cash. We were in cash conservation mode, just making sure that we can, uh, because we're not even getting phone calls back from our clients. Uh, everybody was in shock and awe mode. I think that lasted about, I would say about six weeks maybe. And then we started adjusting to that. Um, and what we did after that was just harvesting the, the pipeline that we had. Uh, people were still not returning the phone calls, but we're just harvesting the pipelines we had. That lasted about three months. And at that point in time, we started realizing that no, this kind of, the business is actually improving. Uh, it's it's not shrinking; it's actually expanding. And we started seeing uh, real bottlenecks in with the team that we had. Like we were we were we actually had too many things on the plate. So we had to just address that pieces of it. We we did make highs, specific highs on that. So we did spend cash in the in in the last three months. We did spend we did may add to our uh, the number of people that we had, and but it's all all in very core areas. We were adding people in engineering. We were adding people in in, in customer success, uh, harvesting the, the the deals that we had, uh, taking the people that we already uh, had in our pipeline to the finish line. That was where we we invested. Now I look at this as phase three. As Mark said, uh, people have realized that this is the new normal, and you know I would expect that. I was hoping that when in back back in March, I was hoping that we would come out of this probably in Q1, Q2 of next year. Um, I'm less hopeful now. I think this is going to last for another, another 12 to 12 to 15 months at the at the very minimum. So I mm -hmm. think uh, going back to that normal is probably more. It looks more like Q1, Q2 of 2022. But however, people are returning the phone calls. People are actually we're getting more inbounds on this thing. So now we've and and uh, in fact we've had more inbound requests for investing in the company as well than 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 before. So uh, I, I'm seeing that. Uh, the, the whole cash equation has changed for us. Uh, to Mark's point, I would also say that uh, from an investment standpoint, we have seen that there's been a flight to quality. 
uh, as in, you know, you, you're seeing this in, this in the stock markets as well. Companies that are doing well are now overvalued. Uh, there is more investment dollars that's going after them. You know, we will, we, we've been lucky uh, that we've managed our cash flow well. We, uh, you know, we, our business has expanded, so we have more requests coming in. So we have to expand our team. Now, there's no other option. So we are actually expanding in marketing spends. We are expanding in, in other, other sides of it. In fact, I would say that uh, this quarter, we would have the highest growth in terms of number of employees, uh, the highest growth in terms of the, 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 the revenues on this. So this is a new phase that we're entering in. I, but I don't think that that's, that's typical of all the companies because I'm, uh, I have three separate investors um, and within three separate VC firms. And within those VC firms, I'm part of the CEO panels of those VC firms. And we are seeing a whole spectrum there. We are seeing people who are invested in the travel uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, that those industries have been impacted. Um, selling directly to the consumers have been impacted. So whereas we are lucky that we have been in the, in the enterprise sales side of it. So we are starting to actually turn uh, and, and, and increase the cash, flow, cash burn at this point in time. Uh, but I would continue to say that uh, we have to be watch out for cash. Uh, I mean, cash, yeah. you, you die. As a startup, you die the, the day you run out of money. So uh, managing that is all, it's always there. You can wake me in the middle of the night and I'll tell you how much money is there in the bank and how much is it <laughs> my ARs and, 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 and APs. Um, so um, I think. So cautious, cautious optimism, the, uh, the footnote <laughs> there from, from, from what we're, from what we're talking about. I think that's one of the, uh, uh, one, you know, one of the interesting things that we, that we've seen that, that, you know, obviously as a staffing business, we've seen, um, demand sort of really get very, very cautious through April and May, whilst there were still people hiring and probably more so than I've anticipated. Those numbers have now more than doubled um, over the last uh, couple of months in terms of people who are looking in, in, out in the marketplace. So we're seeing that sort of term and that sort of confidence and people recognise, I think you, you, you termed it there, the new normal, that there is a need to, uh, to adapt and grow and, and build into businesses. So it's, it's been very interesting to see that. You touched there um, on the, the sort of... Uh, uh, you know, how long this lasts for and, and I think it's uh, uh, and going back to that sort of much used uh, terminology of the new normal that we that we, uh, that we that, that seems to be on the news every single day at the moment part of that has been a complete revolution in the workplace Claire you've been a, a, a um, advocate of uh, flexible working for some time and uh, and this has been less of an issue for you than for, for many many companies out there um, the future of fintech the, the, the you know the, the death of the city uh, you know New York London is, is this the end for New York and London? Are we going to see everyone working from uh, bedrooms in Connecticut? Or, or are we going to see, uh, is it, you know, and how best do we, do we see people really maximise that opportunity for what could, as Arjun said, be another 15 to 18 months of this? Well, so, yeah, as you, as you say, um, I, I've always thought that flexible working was the future for most industries, not, not specifically fintech, just in general. And that's about, the fact that humans want autonomy. And if you can give your employees more autonomy and trust them and let them, you know, be grown-ups, they will do a better job for you. That's my belief. Um, and, and the pandemic has been very helpful in regards to forcing everybody who was resistant to that idea to try it. And, you know, lots and lots of very sort of skeptical people have said, I never thought I'd hear myself say this, but this is really good. We're, we're more productive than we ever thought we, we would be. Brilliant. You know, that, that's great. Um, and I think for everyone, flexible working is now part of the future of how they will work. Now, it depends what you mean by flexible working, right? That doesn't mean no one will have an office and no one will the go to New York again. definitions are always interesting. Yeah. I mean, there, there's... Uh, location-based flexibility. Am I working from home, from the office or from somewhere else? Is that somewhere else the same place every time or is it different places? Am I a hybrid model where I spend a certain number of days in the office and a certain number of days not in the office? Um, I think we'll see a lot of, of different permutations of those things. Uh, but you also have time-based flexibility. You know, when am I working? And it might not be that you change the number of hours that you're working, but we've probably all found that we work at different times now than we did when we were going to an office, if we, if we were going to an office. Um, so it, it sort of behooves all of us to use this brilliant clean sheet of paper we've been handed, you know, and take a step back and say, okay, so what types of work do we need to do from where? You know, what mm -hmm. types of work are best done 
in the office versus at home versus some other place. Um, and, and, and Canvas the staff and, you know, don't think that, I don't think I have all the answers necessarily. And what's good for me personally, you know, I love working independently at home. This is great for me, but there are plenty of people on my team who really miss being in the office around other people. Um, so we're doing a lot of canvassing um, of the team as this, this whole thing goes on so that we can figure out exactly what we want when the time comes. And I think we will, and we've actually downsized our office to basically a storage room in London um, <laughs> because we could, and it's you know, cash, cash management. Um, we will upsize it to something else, but what is that thing? It will definitely not be the same thing that it was before all this happened. It will be much more you know, purpose built for our needs. And you know, fortunately for those of us that are in this situation, um, I think it's going to be a buyer's market when it comes to co-working space. So, you know, yeah. we, we don't have to make a decision right this minute, but we should be able to, to define what it is that we want and get that. And it will involve people going into cities sometimes, but not, not the amount of time that they were. And that obviously has lots of implications for Starbucks among other people. <laughs> uh, sense, even so. if everybody just stayed home one day a week, you know, which is not a, a ridiculous thought that has massive implications. Um, so, yeah. so London will change. New York will change. The, you know, the cities will change. I don't think they will go away. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting. Thing. And, and Matthew, I know you, you, uh, you shared an article uh, yesterday online with regards to uh, Amazon um, and their sort of thoughts and coming back in and, and, and sort of being fairly bullish themselves about sort of getting everyone back into the office because of the benefits of it uh, over the, um, well, at the start of the new year, I believe, that, that, that they're going for. Your, your thoughts on that? I, I guess it's different approaches from different companies. You know, everyone's looking at Google and Facebook and how they're expanding out their kind of home working and so on. But I mean, to, to, to look at the quote from the, that head of Amazon workforce development, she said the, uh, the ability to connect with people, the ability for teams to work together in an ad hoc fashion, you can do it virtually, but it isn't as spontaneous. So that, and, and I think we all agree, but you do miss that. I've had plenty of discussions internally and externally where I wish I was in a room with a whiteboard. You know, the, the, it's, it is very pro, you know, productive in certain scenarios. So mm. I think, like Claire said, it's 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 um, it's getting that mix, and it's and it's having some space that people can congregate and share ideas. But maybe they don't need, don't need to be in the office all the time. And that's how what Steve Jobs designed a new Apple building, so that everyone comes through a certain point, and you still get that mix of ideas and and different people. Similar to the Bloomberg building over the road here as yeah, well. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know what? Though I think you know it comes back to the culture of the organization and how the team feels about its, its organization. Amazon, let's be honest, has not covered itself in glory about its corporate culture. Um, and I can see why, you know, it, it's, if, if you can't trust everybody to be rowing in the same, you know, the same cadence in the same direction, then letting them all work from home is probably not, not your best call. Um, ideally, we want to be running companies where everyone does that naturally because the culture has set them up for success that way. Um, so I think that for a lot of companies, this whole thing is a wake up call to redefine their cultures. Re maybe not even, maybe they have you know, brilliant values and, and they've thought very hard about all of this and it's terrific, but maybe it needs reinforcing or recommunicating or just rethinking with this sort of new lens on it. Um, and, and to find ways of ensuring that, that the culture, which you know, in the case of Essentia, we have a set of values like everyone else, but they include things like respect, you know, which is basically doing as you would be done by, um, and co cooperation. And uh, we have to make sure that we are reinforcing these things in a remote construct. You know, how do you make sure that people are behaving like that? And that the people who are behaving are being rewarded for behaving that way. Um, it starts with me. I have to behave that yeah. way and be extra careful about behaving that way and, and making a big thing of it when other people are behaving that way. 
and well, from what I've seen, that works. Yeah, and especially, especially, I think it's really interesting with you as a CEO of a business that's headquartered, you know, over you know, a, a significant flight away. I think that's 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 equally important for you as well, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of crazy. I haven't I haven't been to London since January. I <laughs> used to go you. one week a month, <laughs> you know. But the business is fine. The team is great, you know. Yeah. Even I didn't yeah, think so it I, would be that good, but it, it's yeah. I've been surprised. And, is that, and exactly the same but, with me and, and our New York office as well. I think. Sorry, Mark, you were... No, I think, I, you know, I, I, I think the challenge is, um, you, know, it, it, you know, it's like maintaining, you know, your culture or maintaining your team is fine, right? But I think one thing that has been exposed, uh, you know, and I think Claire actually covered part of it with her, fir- with her first remarks is, is that actually people's perception of the role of the office has completely changed, right? Mm. So... So, you know, you know, Illuminate is a small organization. We're 10 people. You know, historically, that's been across two locations. You know, it's now across four um, because of COVID. Um, you know, but the, you know, the, the you know, you know and, and we've always worked one day a week from home. So, like, like turning on the other four days was just no, was just no problem at all. And, you know, all of Claire's kind of cultural points about how, you know, we work together, you know, all fantastic, right? You know. The interesting fact is that, you know, if you if you kind of applied uh, a little bit of stereotyping, and I'll apply it to myself, right? Is you know, you know, the the forty eight year old you know co founder, you know, during the entire Illuminate journey, my wife has said, "Hey, why can't you spend more time in California?" Which is where I am now, um, you know. And I've been like, "Well, you know, you have Finn." Uh, you know, she's like, we have Finn and we have tech. And I'm like, yeah, but it's the wrong kind of Finn and the wrong kind of tech, with the exception of uh, Baton, who are California-based. Um, you know, and, and of course, you know, I, I've discovered, guess what? I can work from here completely effectively, and that's and that's marvelous, right? The, the interesting thing is the other end of the scale, the younger members of my team of who, you know, probably would have wanted more flexibility, even though we were working 20% uh, remotely anyway, uh, have probably suddenly realized that actually the value of the office as a social hub, right? Not just a place that the crusty old guys make you go to, uh, mm. you know, actually has more of a positive value to them than they, than they previously thought of before. And I think the challenge is if, you know, I, I look at it and say, okay, are you a, are you a innovative organization, right? Or, or not, right? And are you a small organization or are you a large organization? And we can kind of graph that out sort of got now. Uh, Gartner style and I think you know enforced total remoteness hurts you more the larger you are and the more innovative you are if you're large and not innovative it doesn't matter right it's a management challenge right if you're small and innovative it matters a little bit but 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 not as much but but organizations develop and the connections in organization develop like babies' brains right and if you put a baby in a in a room with no toys and no people in it, it is not going to develop in the same way as putting the baby in a room with toys or the baby in a room with toys and other babies right mm. and you know water coolers are not just for politics. I always used to think they were right, but they're actually for going. Hey, Claire, have you met Matthew? You guys are That's both smoking doing area. something with, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you guys are both doing something with X, Y, Z core, right? You, you should, you know, you should compare notes, right? And you can't underestimate the value of those spontaneous neural connections. And that, that's the part that I do think that we, that we miss. And we'll work our way around it, right? But, yeah. but you know, I'm kind of glad that we're 10 very well-established relationships uh, going into this rather than, you know, you know, 150 growing to a thousand and still trying to be super innovative. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's interesting. And look, I, I want to keep an eye on, on that. It, it, this is a, you know, in itself, it's a, it's a whole conversation, but I want to keep an eye on the future as well. Matthew, we've been speaking a lot, um, uh, over, about the, the sort of future of, of tech and everything that you know, we've, we've spoken about in our first conversation about, um, data and, and, uh, and we, and we spoke about the whole sort of future of, of you know, the digitalization of everything that's going on at the moment and how rapid the acceleration is there. You've, you're, you're a great one for looking into the future tech-wise and seeing what, you know, not, not what we've got to be prepared about today, but also what's coming sort of 36 and 24 months down the line. If you're, you're there and you give me advice on what people should be looking at today 
so they can prosper not only when this is uh, this is finished hopefully and and but but also to set themselves up for the for, you know for the bounce what would that look like well i mean it's good always good to start off with a quote um so there's a good quote from andy grove one of the founders of intel he said bad companies are destroyed by crisis good companies survive them and great companies are improved by them so there's a lot of opportunity right now with COVID, it's obviously accelerating change, and it's pretty much caused a rapid reinvention of everything. Um, you know, take a look at, and if, I'm sure you all follow the markets, take a look at the massive growth in big tech stocks. You know, the big five, your Apples, your Amazon, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, their combined market cap is $7 trillion. That's just an insane amount, which, you know, a lot of that has been added just in the last couple of months. Compare that to the FTSE 100. You know, they've got a market cap of 1.8 trillion. So the top 100 companies in the UK have got a market cap of 1.8 trillion. Apple's got a bigger market cap than that. You know, mm -hmm. over, and over in Germany, all of the companies, the 30 companies in the DAX, 1 trillion. So it just goes to show, you know, big tech is, is massively taken advantage and perfectly suited to what's happened with the combination of obviously cloud is a massive one. Um, and then obviously you've got all the e-commerce, you know, everyone was using Amazon and home delivery food services, all of these things all pushing into, um, in, into the inflation of those prices. But it's essentially as well. I know Arjun in a previous conversation, we were talking about kind of irrational exuberance but that, I think that's true in some regards, like like a Tesla. Uh, but in other regards, in the big tech companies, you know, it's it's because there's new opportunities, there's a new future state and a new way of working. So actually, if you look at the valuations of those big tech stocks, and actually, if you look at them against like T-note yields as well, they're not that overpriced. So it's quite it's quite an interesting space we're in. But then, yeah, looking at Tesla, where there's definitely some irrational exuberance there. I mean, that's another beast. You know, they they're now worth $350 billion. But you could argue there is some sort of bubble there. But on the other side, maybe not. You know, they are a very, very innovative technology company that's taken a lot of risks. They've offered something that provides a 10x improvement on existing technologies. You know, the combustion engine has 2,000 moving parts. The Tesla electric motor has 17 moving parts. So, so when you start to look at what Tesla are doing, you know, they also have, you know, solar panels, you know, battery storage, all of these things which you know 10 years from now we'll all be using. You know, there won't be any combustion engine cars and hopefully power will be coming from solar or some other means. So that's why, you know, some of these prices are getting ahead of themselves. But it's always worth thinking out things in the longer run. But you can look at things historically as well. I mean, look at 66 million years ago, you had a massive disruptive event. You know, that led to a rapid Darwinian explosion and evolution. You know, the world was changed, was disrupted massively. And you had previously dominant, slow moving dinosaurs, i.e. incumbents. You know, when the environment changes fast, they couldn't survive and adapt. And you know, I think right now you have, you know, it's, it's not just about surviving, it's about thriving. You know, and I, and I, I feel very, very fortunate that I'm in a software company and, mm. and in particular, you know, a, a, a B2B software company where the, 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 the kind of the world in, in what they're looking at with technology is kind of catching up with probably where we were too early a few years ago. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting space, which has just been obviously accelerated by all of this. So that, um, that kind of thriving right now, you know, and I think a few of you have touched on it already, is the ability to be agile. You know, it's having an exponential mindset and it's a break in embracing then these technologies. And there are lots of, you know, exciting technologies you know, around right now, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. You know, financial markets are very, very slow to adopt new technology. It's kind of death by a thousand cuts. It feels like, you know, we, our customer base, when we're selling to, technology vendors you know the the sales cycle is kind of three to six months when you're selling to banks it's two to three years mm -hmm. you know sometimes you get lucky and it's quicker than that um but one of the big ones you know, i think mark's touched on it you know is cloud um mm. you know the financial markets are only just beginning to embrace the cloud and obviously the 
the take up and adoption and the reluctance to embrace the cloud is dissipated significantly. You know, I've always said the move towards cloud adoption is like a, it's like a tanker ship that's slowly turning. And that has gathered a lot of pace in the last, you know, last six months or, or since, since February, March. And then also look at, you know, you've got cloud technologies, look at workplace collaboration technologies, look at Zoom, Zoom share price like that. Um, look at Microsoft Teams usage like that. This is exponential rise of, of usage in all these different platforms. So that's the, that's the thing that's kind of right there with everyone's embracing and looking at now, you know, it is your, mm. your, your workplace collaboration technology, it's cloud, things like that. And obviously then looking forward, um, you've got some companies that are, that are beginning to look at it as an early adopter or an innovator. People always talk about AI and machine learning. You know, there's, there's kind of slithers, slither, slithers of it kind of dripping into different work streams and so on. But again, AI is a technology that's exponentially getting better every six months. You're getting doublings all the time. So companies should be looking to bring that into their product roadmap so that, you know, in a few years' time, you are fully embracing it. You know, in five, ten years' time, there's going to be companies using AI and machine learning and companies that are not, and the companies that are not are just, you know, not going to be around. You've obviously got all the other big mm. things, you know, your blockchain, um, hyper automation, that's now a kind of a term for, you know, RPA, you know, workflow automation. And then there's the more out there, so which feels like out there right now, but it won't be again in, you know, a few years time from now, you've got the decentralization of the web. That's one to, you know, to, to be thinking about. And one that's really taken off, um, I think because of this this environment we're in about working from home and so on, is VR and AR. You know, that's mm. still in its infancy, but that is beginning to take off. You know, have a look at the share price of, um, there's a company called EXP, um, which is listed on, on the NASDAQ. That's gone up 250% in like the last six weeks. Um, and that's because they provide virtual environments where offices and companies can create a virtual environment and people can still have those water cooler moments with a virtual environment just sitting on another screen. So there's things like that, which are beginning to, you know, it still looks, you know, not, not quite lawnmower man. It's kind of moved on a little bit more than that, but it still is in its infancy. But again, those type of technologies you can see really taking off. So it's kind of looking ahead for the next two, three years. It's always that famous Wayne Gretzky saying, you've got to skate to where the puck's going to be. So yeah. Think about these different technologies and how are they going to be prevalent and how are they going to mature in your markets and, in, and, in, you know, and for your business as well. So what can you do right now to then accelerate towards that point so you get to, you know, in two, three years' time, some of these technologies will start converging at the same time. And at that point, you want to have those already built into your platform or your products, and then you're kind of riding the wave. So when it when it becomes mainstream, you're there. You've got a footprint, you know, on on the web. People know who you are, and you are you are the place to to go to for those particular technologies. And I think on the other side, looking at, 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 your, at your business, there's there's staffing. You know, have you got the right team? If not, you need to get it. And, and you need to be hiring people. I mean, Arjun, you said you've been hiring massively in the last couple of months. You know, we're just starting that ourselves. You know, you need to have employees that can learn quickly because technologies are changing so quickly. You need mm. people that are constantly, you know, inquisitive. You know, the shelf life of information is falling very quickly. So you always need to be learning. It's, you know, you don't even need to be an expert in something. You need to be a good implementer in something. You don't need to understand AI. You need, you need to know how to implement it. You know, things like that. Can you build um, a community and a crowd you know, around, around the ideas that you've got and things you're trying to build up? Can you create a movement or a following? And then you can use that for extracting information, for insights, and ultimately selling to them as well. And then there's... Work, the work for Mark Benioff, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and, th and then it's ultimately you know, making it programmatic. Can you, is there some algorithm you can build in to do this thing? And then you have you know, leveraging assets that are out there. The classic example is, you know, your Airbnb. They don't, you know, they, they created the supply out of nothing. Out of thin air, you've had instantly all this supply come around. 
can you do that in the market you're looking at? Is there existing infrastructure or fixed lines or, you know, fixed, you know, connectivity? Is there something that's already there that you can piggyback on uh, and, and put your information over it instead? So you don't need to be building the pipes. You can just you know, use someone else's for it and then monetize that. Um, and, then, and then I suppose on Claire's point about um, culture, you know, you, you obviously need to have an internal framework and a culture that people know and it's clear and transparent to everybody. And I think now is, if you've not done it already, I totally agree with Claire, we need to, you need to be implementing that now because it's mm. very important when people don't have that opportunity just to have a catch up over a beer at the end of the day, you know, and giving people that, that kind of chit chat, you know, you lose all of that. So, so it's, it's, it's designing, you know, that structure if it's not there and always improving it as well. And I think we're probably, you know, we could all be guilty of, you know, not, not looking at that enough because sometimes it caught, gets caught in the backseat when you're just trying to sell stuff. So that's, yeah. you know, now, now's a good time to do that. Um, yeah. And I, and I suppose just, just to round off, you know, sometimes it feels like you're heading towards like a, a Mad Max future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's there's scarcity and everyone's fighting each other, but then actually we should be heading towards like a Star Trek future, you know, a world of abundance, you know, there's abundance of technology there's an abundance of people. So how are you going to ma manage that and how are you going to plan to take advantage of that? That planning, I think, is is uh, is, is critically important. Arjun, I want to come over to, to, to you with that as well because, uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to invite questions to, to, to come through now from the audience as we move into the last 15 minutes because I know there's a couple of the panellists who have a hard stop. So we could be talking for hours, I know, on all of this. But Arjun, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's something which is, I've, I've, I've courted a few questions before, you know, beforehand. And one of the things that people were asking about is, is um, you know, with, it, with this and, and companies looking to scale and gain investment as a company there, you, as you said, you've got three different investors. What's different now about what companies are going to have to do? And, and Mark, you may have some ideas on this as well. What's different about what companies are going to have to do to really stand out and make themselves investable at the moment? What are people looking for? I mean, the, 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 the first one is, I think... Uh, at least for the near, uh, let me t t talk about the, the shorter term, like um, in probably I would say visibilities in the next 12 to 12 to 24 months. And then I'll talk about the longer term. In the 12 to 24 months, as you know, right now the world has changed. You need to have aspirational goals of, of uh, is not going to work, work. You need to have very tangible um, business plans, um, something that's addressing a problem today. And you have to have a clear path to making revenues in this one. So that is an, an important thing in order to, to gen, in order to be funded. Um, I'm also part of a couple of uh, mentor groups where I'm mentoring uh, new business plans from 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 uh, as a part of giving back to the community. I, when, I, when I see when I see business plans uh, where they, where they're trying to be too aspirational about about some things where the market is not well defined, they're trying to crack into that. I, I, I ask them to be a little more cautious and and fine tune that uh, that that those business plans. Now. People who have actually cracked it and are, are, are demonstrating that they've cracked a problem and people are willing to pay for that, I think, I think you, you are in a, in a much better position, uh, right? So, so if, if you've not cracked anything, if you're, not, if you're trying to enter into a new marketplace, which is, not, which is not done yet, at this point in time, it's probably going to be difficult. It's probably going to be difficult to find investments in that. If you, st if you started demonstrating that you, you've cracked it, the problem is something that people are willing to pay, then you have a better shot at doing a Series A. Now, on a, on a Series B and, and, and beyond, that's where we, we are, um, you know, not only have we demonstrated that it's, it's a problem, we are actually starting to show growth. I think um, this is where, you know, you, you, you are either in the growth stage or you're not, uh, right? And so, so companies that are in that stage, again, um, you, have, you should have demonstrated that, you know, not only have you, have you closed a few accounts, you're able to cross-sell and upsell your products. And you're, you're, you're demonstrating that you can actually break even in the next you, you should have a path to break even and, and, and show an increase in your, in, your, in your market on that one. I think those companies will always be in demand. In fact, mm. there is quality. There is, there, I, I would say that there is, there is uh, investment that's seeking companies such as these. You know, uh, uh, when you look at a VC fund, and Mark will, you should, will, will tell you about this one, right? And VCs are not going to sit on their money forever. They have to demonstrate an ROI for their limited partners as well. So if you have already raised some money, there is, you have to invest it in, in some companies. And so, so there is always a flight towards quality at this point in time. So I think in the next 12 to 24 months, you will see a flight towards quality. 
uh, a lot more diligence on business plans, execution of business plans, and you know, and and I think you have to do this as a VC. You have to do this as a, as a company. You know, if you're not, if you have team members that are not meeting it, it's probably time to upgrade. Um, it's it's a hard thing to say, but you know, this is this is a new this is a this is a real reality, and you have to constantly tune this tune this one. And that's that's not saying that that's that's a bad culture. I mean, performance is a part of the culture. Um, you know, that's that's important. Uh, so that's what I see in the next 20, uh, 12, 12 to 24 months. In the longer term, um, you know, there are going to be, this is, this is actually, uh, I, I look at the COVID as something that is uh, a catalyst for change. It's, mm. it's forcing markets to change in a way, not just markets, not just not, not just financial institutions, but the entire market to change. It's a catalyst for a, for a change. So, you know, in the longer term, I, I think there are going to be some fundamental things that are going to change. I mean, how's the world going to be 20 years? I always think about this. How's the world going to be 30 years from now? Uh, are you ready for that world? And uh, it's a scary world, uh, scary mm -hmm. for people who, are, who, who cannot think of change, who cannot accept it. I would speculate that in 30 years from now, we would have landed in another, another foreign, uh, you know, in, in another, uh, we would have conquered space, uh, whatever conquering means uh, at that point <laughs> in time. You would have had so much of information. You think you think you have enough information on your on your phone now. You will have, you know, uh, petabytes of data that that come in uh, every 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 day, and you have to be able to make sense of the data. So AI mm -hmm. is going to be normal. Uh, and and are you ready for that world? And are you able to solve problems in those world? Uh, you know, there's almost a, a. I remember there was a a clerk in a in a patent office who resigned i think at the turn of the century of the of the 19th century he said everything that has that could be invented has already been invented to the arbitrage um and uh, i think i think uh, if that's what you think in the in the in the in the turn of the century about 150 years ago look at what's going to happen in the next 30 years look at the yeah. problem that's going to happen in the next 30 years and are you ready for that world because some sometimes skill sets that are there today May not be may not be ready for that. You know, may not be able to bridge that one. And so, as a as a as a company, as a as a as a community, as a country, you need to be you you need to watch out for this new world. And are you ready for that world? I am, Mark. <laughs> but don't be thirty years ahead of the problem. Oh, right, right you're now, gonna out, you're going to run out of money. Uh, you know, that's, I've uh, that's only for the, the next the challenge. Month. I think my observation that I would just add to that is, you know, and it kind of picks up on, you know, a, a lot of what Arjun said and a lot of what, what Matthew said before it, though, is that actually, you know, and I'm not a tech, I'm not a technologist, I don't run a technology firm, but we invest in technology, but nobody here is in technology for technology's sake, right? And so, you know, I, you know, I, I, I say, you know, quite often that we're not really a technology investor at all. We're a business solutions investor, right? Like the skating to where the puck is going to be in our world is not about looking over the horizon to quantum computing implications 20 years down the horizon, right? Because again, you know, like no one's going to get funded. Uh, you know, no one's going to have a, a return. They're going to run out of money. Uh, and, and actually, don't forget, most venture funds are ten-year vehicles, right? They've got to get in and they've got to get out uh, in that in that in that period of time, right? We are the beta testers of technology, right? I say this all the time, right? You know, I wake up in the morning, I go and check on what my teenage daughters are up to on Instagram, and big data and cloud delivery and AI you know, invariably lends me a pair of shoes or a t-shirt that I didn't know I needed. And, you know, I've probably bought one by, by the time I get to my desk. Um, you know, that's where we're going as an industry, right? But we talk a really good game as an industry. Like, you know, if you look at the way the industry was talking about blockchain in 2016, right? You'd think it had already solved all the problems, right? Right. It isn't even close to scratching the surface of any of the problems. Right. Um, so, you know, you know, right now, you know, I think Arjun said it very well in terms of there's what's going on over 24 months. Right. We don't know what the route back to a new normal is. We do know that one part of the new normal is that the future of business continuity is where we are today. Right. So that at least is something that, that, that you know, we know that the, the stack has to be ready for. Right. So what are the must haves? And how do you position your company as a must have for that, for that, for that world, right? You know, and that's what, you know, that's what we're looking at. 
it's um, uh, it's yeah, it's, it's it's certainly a brave new world, and I think people who are who are looking at that investment and looking to position their companies absolutely have to be to be aware of this. I'm going to move over to the uh, the Q and A's. We have something here which I think is um, right in your sweet spot, uh, uh, Claire. So I'm going to push it to you from Susan Susan Cuff over here. Uh, do you not think it's very important that our teams have sufficient space in their homes to be able to work from there? Some of the less senior people are too embarrassed to have uh, have to confess that they're sharing a kitchen table with three, four flatmates, and the situation is incredibly tough for them. What 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 is yeah? You know, when when we're looking at uh, people here, everyone thinks about right. Okay, you can go off to your office or you can be here, but people are literally in in, in you know this this has further implications on on working parents and everything like that as well. How do we deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I'm a working parent from a <laughs> with young kids, and I I feel the pain of people in that situation for sure. Um, and I've seen amongst our team the sort of example that, that Susan raises where, you know, it's, it's a younger person potentially, but somebody who, who has flatmates and maybe not that much space. Um, and that's hard. I do think it's important that our teams have sufficient space if they're going to be working from home. And yet, you know, we can't necessarily control that at this stage. Um, if, if, and as things open up, you know, I would suggest that home isn't the only option. Mm. You know, there, I mean, our office in London is in a, a co-working space where we have our own, we, we have had our own space, but there's also sort of you know, generic space that, where you can go to work. And those people on my team who have a situation kind of like that, or even people who have enough space for their needs, but are just a bit bored of, you know, sitting in their guest room every day, they're going to the office a couple of days a week just to work from that communal space, according to their own preferences and, you know, how safe they feel doing that. Um, and you know, a tough one because we, we hired these people not on the basis that they had sufficient space in their house <laughs> to do the job. Going forward, we might want to make that a criterion, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Mm. Um, but we have to uh, be sensitive to what people have and don't have and and it, space is one thing but also you know chairs and desks and you know do you even have a decent setup it's yeah. not necessarily that we've seen a lot of expensive. those home setups haven't we with the uh, ironing boards and uh <laughs> yeah. various other footstools being used at, from from different people haven't we you but i'd like, I'd like it if, the, if people weren't embarrassed to to say you know i want people to just say i have four people sitting at my kitchen table this isn't good fine yeah. you no know, one's passing judgment on you you know you can have help. a lot of space and, and it can be open plan and you can't stop your furry co-worker from joining <laughs> joining important <laughs> meetings well it's been disappointingly quiet that co-worker i was hoping for more comments from, but if, from, if, from well then, don't worry if the neighbor walks the dog in the next 60 seconds you might get your wish baby. <laughs> um claire I'm, I'm conscious that you've got your meeting so please um, but there's one question i want to i want to shoot out to everyone as well so claire if you've got to shoot please don't hesitate to do so and thank you so much for your contribution um you know that, that's far into it but i do want to get one more question in before we before we sign off it's come from ml uh and it says um, I welcome your comments on the st also it's very kind of it to say an excellent webinar so well done everyone pat on the back there. <laughs> pat on the back there and thank you ML um, but uh, I, I welcome your comments on the current state of key challenges in the market in addition to data flow and efficiencies what are the wider benefits of technology across the financial ecosystem uh, Matthew I'm going to shoot that to, to you if you catch that one yeah, sure. I, I might turn that around a little bit and, and pick up on more of the challenges first and, and echoing something that Mark said at the beginning. You know, it's all well and good having all of these innovation departments, but now you need to start adopting technology. You know, there's, there's, there's definitely the in financial markets, the, the, the speed to market for you know, the, the, the providers like ourselves, speed to, with our speed to market is probably our greatest asset but then you get hindered by dealing with incumbent, you know, massive banks and institutions who take two, three years to do things. Once that gets sorted out, which, you know, banks are setting up faster ways to onboard small companies, innovation departments, which have their own budgets and have more autonomy and have greater say in kind of infosec discussions and so on. Once all these things um, are a bit more aligned, then then you can start to unleash some of the efficiencies and so on that a lot of the 
software companies and cloud providers can provide. I think you're going, you're going again, you know, what, what Mark said, it's about, it's about this, isn't it? You're, you're, you're used to having everything's real time, everything's click of a button, it just works like water and electricity. Mm. I think that, that's the wider benefits of it, things being more, more connected, more integrated and real time. And then you get better analytics, better insights, and then you get into this virtuous kind of flywheel effect where you, know, you can learn from more data, improve what you're doing, improve the workflow, streamline, automate. And then, all, and then the humans can then kind of move out of these, these legacy manual processes and focus on you know, discussing strategy and ideas, which robots can't do for a while yet. Yeah, I, I, I think... Yeah. Any addition I was going to say, invite, invite further comments. Yeah, I, I just add, it's not about the benefits of data or technology again for their own sake, right? Again, you know, the, the whole reason that we set Illuminate up was we saw a infrastructure stack that was just no longer fit for purpose for a world where post the financial crisis, you'd seen huge deleveraging of balance sheets. Well, so, you know, you can use information as a proxy for balance sheet because you can't have lazy balance sheet anymore. We'd seen huge multi-jurisdictional regulation, which is, amazingly is only just starting to, you know, make itself felt in, in, you know, in, in lots of ways. So, so you need technology to be able to operate in those, um, in, you know, in those ways in a compliant and controlled manner. And COVID, you know, adds another challenge to, to that overlay. Um, and last but not least, you know, lots of our industry is in a perfect storm because, you know, because of the cost side of the equation, right? And, you know, even if existing vendors could move fast enough, and even if these slow moving large buyers could move with those vendors fast enough to meet all the needs of a deleveraged cost, you know, co you know, uh, you know cost impacted, compliance impacted world, I don't think they'll be able to do it in a cost model that actually was sustainable for them, right? You know, look at the, the challenges around asset management, you know, active versus passive, fee compression, no more softing, you know, needing to, uh, you know, needing to pay for, you know, a lot more of your own stack and meet new compliance challenges, MIFID, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's, it's a truly, you know, horrific business challenge, right? Um, you know, you know, which by the way, if you're a emerging early stage FinTech is a truly fantastic, uh, you know, opportunity because that's the beauty of a different vantage point. Um, so, so the actual, for me, the, the, the answer to that question is it's actually about sustainability, right? Uh, Claire, good to see you. Uh, nice Thanks, to see Claire. You. Um, um, you know, it's about the sustainability of franchises within our space. And that's about the sustainability of, you know, the financial services industry and the jobs that support it as we, as we know it. I, I, so I echo what Mark just said. I think, Sorry, come on. I think, I think it's, a, it's a very important thing what Mark just said. Sustainability is such an important thing. See, uh, we, we sold, our, we sell our softwares and we've sold it to, uh, you know, half a dozen of the, of the top, top 15 banks, I would say, um, you know, and, and these are, these are just live in production. These are, these are not POCs or any of that stuff. What I've learned, I've learned a lot from, from, from people in the banks. I mean, it's, it's amazing that, you know, you, you look at them and you think that they're, they're slow and there's legacy and all this stuff. Some, some of the smartest people work there um, and, and they're aware of this thing. And I almost draw this analogy back to the early or, or late nineties. Remember when Amazon was just selling books hmm. um, and then you, today they're the most valuable company in the world. Uh, and, and along the way they have, you know, you, you, you love it uh, on one side, but they've, just, they've changed the whole ecosystem. They've, they've, they've changed jobs. They've, 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 this is what's going to happen to, this is what's happening to capital markets as well, or financial institutions as well. So on one side, I mean, it's almost, almost not fair. And I mean, Amazon had an unfair advantage in, in some sense. Uh, the brick and mortar stores, you, you held them to a different set of standards than mm -hmm. the Amazons where you would actually buy something and you did not have to pay any taxes. Um, and, and that is okay for some time. So, so it's almost an unfair playing field. And unfortunately, I feel like that's what's happening in, 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 um, in financial markets as well. So it's an unfair, on, on one side, you, you, you have these banks that are being highly regulated. It's very hard for them to make any changes. Uh, and they're aware of this. They're aware of the looming threat of this. You talk about neo banks, and it's an unfair advantage that the neo, quote unquote, neo banks have. You know, they're not regulated. Um, is your money safe there? I don't know. 
maybe it is you hope it is um but but we'll figure it out later right i mean you 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 but you you hold you hold a large bank to a different set of standards now the reason i i bring this up is the legacy that the technology that that you have in the banks is old they know it some of the smartest people work there they know that it's old and it's a it's a huge barrier to entry for that one you know we have to pass through so much to get to this one and so we had to invest a lot of money to get to this level where we could sell to the banks and say now we are ready to the big game now that we sell to the banks they say how do i implement the next set of solutions let's give it to this company this technology company let's just give them more and give it give them more and more things so our best use cases come from from come from banks that we've already sold to you know mm-hmm. all i need to do to my next product roadmap is to say let me just listen to them and tell me what what i do. i can just take orders on that one uh, so it's a it's a, it's also it, it sets up a, a, a great uh, moat for for companies like us who are who are already in this thing uh, so it's a it's sustenance it takes a long time to get to this thing can you sustain this a long term then you're good if you can't yeah. then yeah. it's a different game and that comes down to the whole thing about cash management we've spoken about before about uh-huh. making sure uh-huh. you're investable yeah. as we've spoken about before about skating to where the puck is before and having good teams who are, who are well looked after it is a debate that we could literally go on for for, for hours i know all of having spoken to all of you individually uh, and collectively it's uh, it's it's something that i know that there's a shared passion for and it's and it's and it's wonderful that uh, you've shared so much great insight today so i thank you very 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 much uh, for for such great insight and such value as well because i think there's there is you know the thing for me to come out of this is is that we're in an exciting time but it's a different time and those who are adapting and, and making the right sort of plays in it are, are set for uh, for very very exciting futures. So, thank you to everyone who's uh, who's logged in to uh, to listen to these guys uh, uh, and their infinite wisdom. Um, thank you to you all for for uh, for sharing that that wisdom with us as well. And uh, we will uh, be sharing the video out to, uh, to to far and wide as well. These are some of the most uh, downloaded and uh, widely watched episodes of FinTech Focus TV all together on one screen. So I'm extremely excited to see how far that reaches. Um, listen, guys, it's been great. Thank you so much. And uh, and look, I'm sure if uh, anyone wants to get in touch, they can reach out to you on all the relevant social channels, right? Absolutely. Thank, yep, you, thank you very much for the opportunity, great Toby. Stuff. Good to see you guys. Likewise, good to see you again and catch up with you all very, very soon. Thanks for coming. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye.